Has something of their ever bothered you and caused you trouble? Have you been laying on your bed sometimes and you couldn't sleep? Has something come across along the way that has caused you to, I don't know, not even let it go along the way? Seems like the only thing that you're thinking. For some of us, we spend a lot of time thinking about food. Food is a very important type of thing. I know they've been talking about all sorts of things. Which egg is better? You know, when you go to the grocery store now, you have a lot of choices in eggs. You can get a brown egg or a white egg. You can get an organic egg, a free range egg. You can get, um, they got all sorts of things now. But I remember when I was growing up, I would go shopping with my father, and when we would get eggs, it was either extra large, large, or medium. That was the choice. And now people are really worried about what goes into their eggs. They're worried about what's going on with their food. Uh, recently I was watching something on the news where they were talking about eggs. And they did test and basically the nutrients and what was in them was basically the same no matter what type of definition they put of what the egg was. And the only thing that they could do was to try and test them to find out if there was a difference in taste. By the way, according to what the scientists say, and I haven't done this test myself, so don't, I'm only reporting what was reported. The only difference in taste was freshness. The fresher the egg was, the better it tasted. It didn't matter whether it was brown or white. It didn't matter if it was organic or not organic. It didn't matter whether it was free range or not, or whether it was caged or not. Freshness mattered. And yet, folks, the people in the stores know that we're worried about things and put all different type of things on boxes in order to ease our worriedness and get us to buy their products. And we're not sharing something that is true. A lot of salesmanship today deals with our worries. Even so much that if you're uh, having a problem sleeping, you need to change your bed out every eight years. Right? That's what the ad says. What do we do? with worry, because I think worry pulls us from our true focus and puts us in a direction that we shouldn't go. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn them to Luke, the 12th chapter. This can also be found in Matthew chapter 6. The first part talks about in verse 22 that we should not worry about, about life, what we eat and drink and what we put on our bodies. Life is more than food or clothes. I think we forget that sometimes. But our day and age is not exactly like it was in the time of Jesus. At the time of Jesus, four out of every five persons was a slave. They relied on someone else in order to provide them their food, their clothes, and everything that they had. There wasn't a lot of freedom. They couldn't uh, grow anything. Anything they would put on the ground, the ground belonged to someone else, and someone took a portion of everything that put, was put in. And yes, we are fortunate to live in such a wonderful country, 
most of us don't worry about food and clothes except whether it looks good on us or whether it tastes good. But we do have worries. And we focus on those worries and focus, instead of focusing on that which is most important. And so Jesus starts with the examples. Consider the ravens. For they neither sow nor reap, which have neither have storehouses nor barns. And God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? Have you noticed that even in the biggest stores, there are often sparrows inside those stores? I was in the Walmart the other day, and a sparrow let, let down not too far from where I was shopping at in the Walmart. In another place, Jesus uses the term uh, sparrow instead of, of raven. But if you notice what goes on, what do these birds do? Most of you are, are separated from how food is grown and how it was done. When I was growing up, my father used uh, probably a, a third of the backyard, and there was always the garden back there. My father taught us how to have a garden. He would till up the ground that was there. And at that time, my dad couldn't afford any type of tilling equipment. We had this, we had this thing that had a, a wicked wheel and all sorts of little sharp things that went around. And, and you, had to, you were taught along the way how to use this thing in order to till up the ground. It was tilled by hand. My dad now has the power of one. But when he had us, we had to do it the hard way. And I can remember we would till up the ground and we would do all of this work. We were taught how to plant the seeds, how to do all the things, and you had to do a lot of this work. But you know, the raven that is out there does none of this work and yet is provided with food. Many of you think here that you have to do absolute everything in order to take care of yourselves. And I need to remind you, God is taking care of you. Amen. Now, yes, I believe that God expects us to go out and work. I believe that God expects us to do the things that we should do. That he, you know, even the raven goes out and looks for food. Even the sparrow is constantly looking for food. Striving to find that, and especially in this time of year when the eggs are coming out, the little babies are coming out, the sparrows don't stop. They are constantly looking for more seeds, more things to bring in order to provide for those little ones. Yes, God asks us to do that. But have you ever considered what happens in a field when you plant it? What can you do once you plant the seeds? You can keep the weeds away. Yeah, that's true. But do you have the power and order to take that seed and start life coming into it? I, I can remember we would take those, those kernels of corn, they were dried up, shriveled. They, they, they would go into the ground shriveled and you would look at it and you would wonder what could be done. And God has the power to, to get that kernel of corn in order to burst out and come to life, even though it looks like it's dead. Every once in a while we would go out and we would water that, yes, but God provided the rain, God provided the sunshine in order to grow the garden. And I can remember when you would see those first little blades coming out of the ground. That had to teach us the difference between that which was good and that which was bad coming out of the ground. I'm afraid we pulled a few good things out. My father didn't get mad, he just, and we replanted. But we learned along the way that God would take care of what was going on and how God was going to do things for us. The next lesson is height. 
How many of you kids want to grow taller? I want to be taller. I remember the day. My daughter was upset. She didn't grow taller than her mother. She's just a little bit shorter, but I have to look up to my son. And I'm six foot two, and I have to look up to my son. But which one of us can change our, our height? Now, I know you ladies can put on high heels. <laughs> but I also hear once you're in those shoes for about an hour or so, what are you saying? You wish you had something more comfortable on. Yes. I don't know how you ladies walk in high heels. I know what I would do. I'd fall flat on my face. <laughs> and yet I watch you ladies walk around so gracefully in high heels. I've never learned how to do that. Probably never will. <laughs> but sooner or later those shoes have to come up and guess what happens? You're back to being the same height again. In fact, I'm going to tell you, my grandmother used to brag that she was five foot one. You all didn't know my grandfather. My grandfather died when I was 11. And he was six foot three. Five foot one, six foot three. Okay. Get the picture? Tall and the short of it. <laughs> I saw the between the two of you. <laughs> When she died, she was four foot ten. The sad thing is, is as we get older, we start shrinking. In fact, if you want to measure yourself at the tallest, measure yourself as soon as you get out of bed. That's when you're at your tallest, by the way. Don't measure at the end of the day because you're always shorter at the end of the day. You can't do anything about height. We try. And then he talks about the lilies. You know there's an exit along 40, between here and 440. It was gorgeous. I know there were construction workers out there. But you know what made it look gorgeous? The beautiful red poppies. What does the lily do out in the field? When I was growing up, Grandma and Grandpa's place was, was on, a, on a lake, and there was a spot that went to a shallow part, and you could see the beautiful lilies. Do you know what lilies grow in? Water lilies, do you know what they grow in? All of the dead leaves go into the water and they get down in there and when you walk in and they decompose, it is the... <clears throat> you step out into what they grow in and it oozes in between your feet, your, your toes, and you reach down and it says, ew, awful gunk. But the most beautiful flower comes out of the ugliest things that are gone. Who created it that way? Those water lilies look grander than the most beautiful clothes that we can put on. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew that even Solomon in his glorious outfits couldn't outshine the lilies. Why do we worry about these things? the latest fashion, the latest things. Can we really, is, is this what our life is all about? Folks, I, I really think that too many times we worry about the wrong things. seek what we should eat or what we should drink or what 
or have an anxious mind. And then he says this. For all these things the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added. Our nation has been concerned about all of these things and making sure that everything is right and good and everything is going on. We're, we're to worry about the environment, whether fracking is good or fracking is not. Quite frankly, folks, I, I don't know. I do know this. My first goal is to seek the I know along the way that there are a lot of things that come along in order to drive my attention away. And maybe the devil is trying to drive your attention away and put it in the wrong place. But our first thought, the first thing, you know, I like what you mentioned about, the, about making the bed and making sure that it's right. And I think that it is absolutely true that the first thing that we need to do is when we get up is make sure our lives are right with the Lord. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And these will be added to you. When you read the books about uh, the three musketeers and all the things that were happening at France at that time, a lot of things that were happening bad and people were getting bad food in the city of Paris. And it seemed like uh, the, the, those who were in power, yeah, they wanted good things, but they didn't seem to worry about it. Folks, it still is what the issue is. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things will be added to you. For over three years, 12 men got very close to Jesus Christ. At one point, people were leaving so fast along the way, they were leaving Jesus. And the question was asked of Jesus, what about all of those who are leaving here? And Jesus turned to them and said, what about you? You see, the issue is, is that a lot of people are leaving Christianity today. Being a Christian is unpopular in this world, isn't it true? We no longer have a, a nation that is based upon the, the God that we know. No longer is it, is it the issue about whether we are true followers or God. No, no longer is it whether the nation is in God we trust. The issue is, is whether, we, uh, whether we trust in our money, whether we trust in silver, whether we trust in gold, whether we trust in ourselves, whether we trust in our abilities, whether we trust in the health system. Folks, that's not where our worry should be. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all of these things shall be added unto you. I, you know, they've been talking about the, the veterans of administration and how people have died in the hospitals. I, I, I believe that that's true, but any time that we rely upon human beings, errors are going to happen. I fail and fall short of the glory of God, and so does absolutely everyone in this room. Amen? Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things shall be added unto you. You see, our concern is not to be the food, the drink, the clothes. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. In fact, folk don't believe that the, there's any problem. It is the problem that we are not seeking the kingdom of heaven. And how do we do that? I agree with you with prayer. That's part of the reason why I would like to begin a prayer time after the worship service. I'm going to invite you to come back into the room back there. We need to pray, folks. But there's more than prayer that is needed. We need to know what's in this word. 
Is this not God's love letter to us? I do not think that we all know it well enough. I, I was listening to to uh, to uh, 105 and and the preacher that was on there that said that if all of the Christians opened their Bibles, there would be such a dust storm it might block out the sun. I hope that's not true. Folks, do you, do you know what God's Word is? Are you part of are you part of Corinth that was involved with things or are you the faithful that are wanting to find out what is in God's Word? And you know what the last thing you need to do? You need to share it. I was filling up with gas this week over at the sheet, saw a man across from me, we started talking, and when we left, I said, God bless you, and he said, God bless you. We need to do more of that, folks. We need to share what is going on, and share our faith, and share our hope, and share the things that are going on. God has called us to be his disciples, and what that means is sharing. Has God work in your life. If he has, you should be sharing it. And you see, that's all upon keeping the kingdom of God first into our lives. That has to be the first emphasis, has to be the first goal, has to be the first thing that goes on. Now, I'm not going to tell you that Pastor Peterson is the perfect one in doing that, because I'm not. But I'm telling you that every time that a problem comes and a worry comes, the first thing that I try to do is reorient myself with God. I like what Jesus says next. Do not fear, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fear not. You know, no matter what anything is going on, he's trying to remind us what he's doing. What is his pleasure? What is his will? What is his direction? Where is he going? A lot of people think along the way that God's purpose is to be mean and nasty and horrible. Their idea is that the God of heaven is a vengeful God. They forget what his purpose is. Why did Jesus come on this earth? Why was he on that cross? Have we forgotten what the purpose is that God has had? What is wrong with us? All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us fail. All of us do things that are wrong. We should be helping one another to remember what God has called us to do. God has called us to be a part of his good pleasure and to follow his will. To be part of his kingdom. Look at what the Lord did. He did not even spare his own son. When Jesus went to the cross, he went there because I put him there. He went to the cross because you put him there. It was our sins that put Jesus on the cross. And he went there because what was God's purpose? God did not want to see any of us to fail. God did not want to see any one of us to go because what happens because of our sins? The Bible says that when we sin, we're going to receive death. You can't get away from it. We can create all the drugs in the world. We can do all the wonderful things along the way. There is nothing in this world that will ever keep you away from death. The moment we are born, cells are dying in our body. Did you know that? The fortunate thing is that when you're young, your cells are multiplying so fast that you keep growing and you're doing okay. Now, when you start getting past your age, you're declining instead of moving forward. Hate to say it, it's true. And I know that there is only one way in order to be victorious over death. And that is what God's purpose was. That's what God's goal was. And Jesus died on that cross, so I do not have to be afraid of death. You don't have to be afraid of death. You're
your sins, my sins, they will not hold us back. The only thing that keeps us from God's kingdom is ourselves. And Jesus was willing to go all the way. He didn't want to die. Jesus did not want to die. But what did he say at the end? Not my will, your will be done. And he followed the pleasure of God right up to the cross. Folks, are you following God's pleasure? Because God wants us to be part of his kingdom. I want to share one more text. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And I know that you've heard about the narrow way before and about the small gate. We're going to read that in just a minute. But I just want to remind you something. And I want you to start thinking before we read this. Do you know where they built all of their towns in the Middle East? At this time, at least. Do you know where they built them? They built them on hills. So as Jesus is sitting there and he is, is giving them, they're sitting on the mount, they can look around it and they can see a number of cities and towns on the hills around them. Keep this in mind as we read this, please. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to the destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, when a city is set on, on a hill, why is it why is it on a hill? What was the purpose? And you put a wall around it. Protection. You can see all the people, you can see all the directions, see who's coming and how they're getting. But do you realize that what they did is inside of that wall, what they did is they built a very, very narrow home. In order to get home, you had this narrow door that you went through. It was just wide enough to get you, single file with a camel, behind you, in through the wall. Did you know that? That's why it's called the Eye of the Needle. It was built that way so that an army could rush in and a number of people could overpower the people on the inside. And the way there was a very narrow, rocky road that went up there. Think again what the reason was. If you had an invading army, how were they going to get up there? You see, the Romans became very effective because what they did is they created wide paths. And they used those wise paths in order to move their vast armies and resources so that they could conquer places. So how they would overcome these little cities is they would build wide paths up to them and use all of their power to bring all of those men in order to overcome the defenses. This is why he was talking about the wide and the narrow. Jesus wants you home. And the way home is up the narrow path into the small entryway in order to get into the house, to get into the place where he wants you to be. There is no multitude way that you can get into heaven. There's only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. He wants you home, folks. I need to tell you the rest of the story. Well, what happened is, is when the sun set, guess what happened? The door was closed. And it was locked, and if you were on the outside, it didn't matter if your home was in the inside. It didn't matter if the guy on the other side knew your voice. Guess what happened? You did not get in. You all remember the difference between the five wise and the five foolish? 
this is what happened is the door got closed at a certain time and they couldn't get in and it didn't matter whether everyone recognized their voice. But Jesus wants you to come home that day. So narrow is the path and the door to serve Jesus Christ. And he wants all of us to come home with him. You see, folk, the, the focus is never food, it is never drink, it is never clothing, it is never the things that we think it is. And it should only be, are we heading home to be with Jesus? And we get worried about things. And we get worried about what is going on. And we let this provide our focus instead. You see, folks, God will always provide. I found in life that life is never what I think it's going to be. There are good times, plenty of, and there are times that aren't so good. But you know, in all of them, the Lord has always been there. The Lord's always provided. As long as we keep God first, we don't have to worry. And our Father's good pleasure is He wants the best for us. And He wants you to be a part of this kingdom. But folks, are you ready to go down the narrow path? the last time you saw it. Because there's not one of you that I want to see outside of the door when it gets closed. Folks, when we talked in the planning, we felt that one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted to see revival in this church. We want to be ready for Jesus. So today, I'd like to start. Those of you who would like to, please stay by. I want to have a time of prayer. We want to start reviving in this church. We want to start putting it back the way that God has. so grateful that we serve a God whose pleasure is that we would be a part of his kingdom. And he went to the nth degree in order to win us. If you're ready to seek God today, would you say amen with me? Amen. And you've heard the amens pray that you will help us to seek you, to lay aside our worries and concerns, and to seek you first. And I pray that you will help this church to be more like Jesus.